All right, we're going to be in John chapter 4. We're going to continue in our study of John and, and finish up the fourth chapter today. <clears throat> As you turn to John chapter 4, just going to get a, give a slight recap. We have been following uh, Jesus interacting with different individuals, right, as he's sort of begun, begun his, his ministry. Um, but I want to highlight more of the, the theme of what's been uh, taking place today. Uh, as we have seen, belief has been a, a preeminent theme in John's gospel. John's an evangelistic gospel, and it's written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, right? That by believing, you may have life in his name. Chapter 20, verse 31 tells us that. So God commands people to believe in his Son. It's a command. That's what he desires for his people. In John chapter 6, verse 28, Jesus says this, This is the work of God, that you believe in him, Whom he sent. So the work of God is to bring belief in Jesus to people. That's what he's about doing. Therefore, it is unbelief for which people are ultimately sentenced to hell. Now, a bunch of us recently went through the book of Revelation, and that might not be the first thing that pops in your mind. The idea that unbelief is what sentences people to hell. And the reason might be because if, if those of you who are in there, if you recall, I'll just kind of recap a, a little bit here. When God begins to judge the earth in chapter 6, beginning with the, the great seal uh, judgments, the sixth seal is torn open and cosmic disturbances take place on the, uh, in the heavens. Um, stars fall to the earth um, there's an earthquake, the sun becomes black as sackcloth, the moon becomes like blood. And we're told this in verse 15 of chapter 6 in Revelation. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Uh, these people believe there's a God. They know where wrath is coming from. They believe there's the Lamb. They know the, where the wrath is coming from. And that never changes in uh, the book of Revelation. Even when you get up to the, the, the final bowl judgments, in the fourth bowl, judgment is poured out upon the sun. The sun is given the power to scorch men. And it says this, and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth bowl is darkness and pain that's poured out upon the kingdom of the beast and we're told they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and didn't repent of their deeds. The seventh bowl is poured out and it causes a, a tremendous earthquake unlike any earthquake that has ever happened And great hail, and we're told every island fled away and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent or a hundred pounds. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. And these same men will come to arms and go to battle at the great battle of Armageddon against the Lamb. In the millennial kingdom, with Christ reigning here on earth for 1,000 years, In chapter 20, we're told that Satan will be imprisoned during that time, but then he will be released at the end of the thousand years. And when the thousand years have expired, Satan will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them, fire from God. They have knowledge, belief in God, belief in the Lamb. But today, Jesus is going to confront unbelief. And I think what we te- today we need to look at is, is Jesus' definition of belief. It's not the belief that we, we think. And, and actually, we've actually talked about this on a, on a small level. In chapter 3 of John, if you're already in 4, just make a left-hand turn. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, uh, 
a learned religious scholar. And he has been trying to teach Nicodemus spiritual truths, and Nicodemus does not believe those spiritual truths. And in verse 18, this is what Jesus says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men are supposed to believe in Christ and condemnation comes to those who don't believe. And why does it come? Because a heart that loves sin's darkness and hates the light of the gospel is an unbelieving heart. Jesus says that. At its core, unbelief is rejection of the saving truth from God contained in scripture. In John chapter 16, Jesus says this of the Holy Spirit, verses 8 and 9. And when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. Unbelief is the issue. And Jesus has been interacting with different levels of unbelief. You take Nicodemus, for example. Nicodemus had unbelief. But his unbelief was due to a perceived lack of evidence. A perceived lack of evidence. They, they knew there were signs and the signs were enough to at least lead Nicodemus to the point where, I, okay, obviously you are sent from God. And there are many people that fall into that category of unbelief that requires further evidence. We want to see more. Nicodemus was persuaded that Jesus was sent by God. And what it did, it started him on the path to saving faith. But the miracles didn't give him saving faith, did they? they came, he came inquiring and it eventually led to saving faith for Nicodemus, I believe. We'll see that later. But it didn't immediately bring saving faith. You take the Samaritan woman Jesus has interacted with. Her unbelief was entirely different. It was not due uh, to um, a perceived lack of evidence. She actually needed information. It was a lack of information. She didn't know who Jesus was. She was not impressed by his appearance. She hadn't been exposed to his miracles. But after she experienced his supernatural knowledge regarding her sin and his declaration that he was the Messiah, she believed. And we were told not only her, but many more believed because of his own word after he stayed with them an additional two days. In this account in chapter four today, Jesus encounters some who thought they knew who Jesus was, um, thought they knew all about him. They were um, aware of his works, but they were not impressed by his words or his works. Their knowledge of Jesus did not equate to belief in Jesus. He will interact primarily with one man who seems to represent the entire Galilean uh, level of unbelief. And in this account, we're going to look at three things. One, we're going to look, we're going to observe unbelief. Uh, two, we're going to see unbelief opposed. And three, unbelief overcome. So unbelief will be observed, opposed, and overcome. Let's look at this passage today, starting in verse 43. Now, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman who was, whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed, and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come 
out of Judea into Galilee. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you for the message that you have for us today. It's your word. We want to hear from you. God, I pray that you'd help us to see the importance of belief and help us to see the belief in our own hearts. We have true saving faith in you. We truly believe in you. God, help us to see it through the life of this nobleman and his belief and Jesus' confrontation with him. Guide us into the truth you have for us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in verse 43, let's begin here. We are told that uh, after two days, he departed from there and he went to Galilee. Now, um, there, there is a, a transition that's taken place. We've seen that back before um, he met the Samaritan woman. If you recall, he was near um, outside in Judea in the wilderness. He was near, near where John the Baptist was, was baptizing. He was with his disciples who were baptizing. And he was on his way to uh, Galilee. But when you look at the other Gospels, we're told a further reason as to why he is on his way to Galilee. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, it says this. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Something significant has happened. John the Baptist, at this point in in his ministry, has been imprisoned. It is interesting because... In John, the author's gospel, John the Baptist has figured prominently, right? We have seen a lot of John the Baptist. We've talked about a lot, a lot about John the Baptist. But here, the author does not mention John's imprisonment. He's not mentioned. He doesn't say, oh, so then John was imprisoned. So that's why he goes to Galilee. Why is that so? I think this is one of the reasons John's gospel is so marvelously unique. It is so incredibly good. John, the author... Is, is recalling John the Baptist's last wish. Do you remember his last wish? I mean, he, was, he was confronted by his own followers, and they were saying, look, Jesus has more people than you. What should we do? And what's he say? He must increase, but I must decrease. So John, the author, is, is encouraging that wish. I don't want to focus on John the Baptist. He is now in the past. Instead, chooses to highlight Jesus's ministry. John the Baptist, the greatest man who ever lived, indeed is imprisoned at this time. And we won't hear much of him again in this gospel. Um, John will be mentioned in chapter, um, later in chapter 5. But Jesus speaks of him almost as if it's in the past tense. As if maybe at, at that point, certainly he's in prison, but maybe even beheaded. Uh, so certainly this has happened at this time, but the author instead is choosing to focus on the ministry of Jesus. Why is that so? Well, The ministry of Jesus here in Galilee is the most prolific segment of his ministry. It lasted about 18 months. And during these months, he selects and trains his disciples for full-time ministry. Now, I know we've seen in John that he already has some disciples following him, right? John is there, Peter, but, but they're sort of just tagging along for the time being. When you read the other gospels, he selects them full time and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That happens during this period of time. During this period of time, he delivers most of his major teachings. The Sermon on the Mount takes place during this time. Also, it's when he performs most of his miracles. The interesting thing about the Gospel of John, John does not include that selection and training of his disciples. He does not include the major teachings like the Sermon on the Mount or the end time discourse, the Olivet discourse. He also doesn't include all those miracles. In fact, he just limits it to seven. Just seven miracles. And this particular one is the second. The first one took place in Cana. In fact, we're told that in verse 54, if you go to the end of our passage, this again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, he had done other things. We've, we've noted that. He was in the, the Jerusalem, and we're told that he did many other miracles. But in terms of specific miracles highlighted by John, you have turning the water into wine in Cana, and now you have here the healing of the nobleman's son. Another thing to keep in mind as we go here into Galilee with Jesus is that he was just declared by the Samaritans as the Savior of the world. Do you remember that? That was last week's message. The Savior of the world. You're not just the Savior of Israel, of the Jews, but you are the Savior of the world. And that is true. But while Jesus is the Savior of the world and the gospel will indeed go to the world, Jesus' primary focus is declaring the good news of the kingdom of God to the Jews. And that's why he goes to Galilee. 
He goes to focus on Israel first. So he's going to Galilee, and look at what verse 44 tells us, something very interesting. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now, this is a little confusing. We're told he goes to Galilee, and we're told why? Because he testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Well, first question, when did he testify that? John hasn't mentioned that. When has that happened? Now, this is another example of John here assuming that the readers have read the other Gospels. Do you remember? The Gospel of John is the last one written. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already been written and circulated. All right? So put yourselves in in those days, right? You've come across the book of Matthew. You've read it. Maybe you've just devoured it. You love everything about the book of Matthew. You know all the miracles. You know all the things that were said. You're just totally into the book of Matthew. Now John is written, and he assumes that you have read that, or Mark, or Luke. And several examples of that have come to us already. Do you recall in chapter 1, verse 40, Andrew is called Simon Peter's brother, but Simon Peter has never been mentioned or introduced to us as an audience. So he assumes, you've read the other Gospels, you already know who Simon Peter is. It's hard to miss Simon Peter when you read the Gospels, right? Like, you know, you know who Simon So Andrew, we don't know who that is. Oh, he's Simon Peter's brother. In chapter 3, verse 24, was another example. Do you remember when, when John wrote this? John, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Remember that little note in chapter 3? For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Jesus and John have similar ministries. They're in close proximity. And he tells us, when does these things happen? It happened before John was thrown into prison. What does that assume? That the readers know that John gets in prison, right? Yeah, exactly. This is a similar thing. This assumes the readers know that Jesus is already rejected by his hometown. Jesus grew up in Galilee, in Nazareth, which is in the region of Galilee. And he has been rejected from there. If you go to Matthew chapter 13, um, you can see it written here. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 58. This is where Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So Jesus has been rejected in terms of who he is. We know who this guy is. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. He's a carpenter's son. We know him. What's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. Look at verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. Well, that's odd. He just testified that they won't receive him, but now they received him. Why do they receive him? Having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. Jesus is not duped by their receiving of him. That's the point here. He knew that even with the warm reception, he was still not really accepted. They didn't honor him. They were curiosity seekers. Impressed by his, his cleansing of the temple and the miracles that he performed at the, the feast there. The reception, in other words, is not genuine. It is superficial. It's shallow. And Jesus is never accepting of a superficial or shallow faith, which is the point of this whole story. And so there is a general unbelief in Galilee, of the people of Galilee. And so John places this account of the nobleman's son here to highlight that exact thing using the example of one particular man. And here he will pose this man's unbelief. Look at verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, um, this is pretty ironic if you think about this. This is the very place where Jesus had performed his first miracle, a miracle that exhibited his undeniable, supernatural power. What did he do in Cana? Do you recall? Right? There was a, there was a, a tragedy. <laughs> right? They're about to run out of wine at a feast. Desperate measures. Desperate times. Actually, it could have been a, a, a major faux pas, right? The family who they know and love who had the wedding could have be, been extremely embarrassed 
by the fact that they ran out of wine. The mother comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, do something about it. So what does Jesus do? He saw the water pots that were filled up. The water pots were used for ceremonial cleansing, very symbolic of the outward religious works of the Pharisees. He says, fill those pots up with water to the brim. And why to the brim? Because nothing can be added. You don't add anything to Jesus's way. It's his way. You don't add anything to it. He says, fill it to the brim. And then Jesus doesn't touch the pots. He doesn't pray over the pots, right? He doesn't do any of that because nothing else was needed. Jesus already said what was needed. Does that make sense, right? It was very symbolic. Here. This is just, and all you need to do is go dip in a cup and take it to the, the master because it's now wine. And what Jesus had done is he had created a far more superior wine from that of the inferior wine using none of the natural processes known to man, no fermentation process, none of that. And the point is belief in Jesus and his righteousness is far superior to the old works-based, outward works righteousness the Pharisees practiced. And so that took place in Cana, and here he is again in the very same place. But here there's something different. There's a certain nobleman whose son is sick. The nobleman, Basilikos is the name, it's a royal official. So it's quite possible that this man was in the service of Herod Antipas, who would have been the Tetrarch of Galilee during this time. And this nobleman has a sick son, and he's from Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is not in Cana. Capernaum is about 16 to 20 miles away. It's a distance. It's a good walk. And so he is in Capernaum, and you have Jesus here in Cana. This is the scenario. Now, just as a side note, some people think that this um, story is a variant of the healing of the centurion's servant. Have you, if you recall the centurion's servant, you can find that in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7. However, I think there's significant difference between the two, and therefore they are different stories. Keep in mind as well, right? John ends the whole books by saying Jesus did many other things, and if we were to write them all down, there wouldn't be enough books in the world, all right? So it's it's not impossible for me to believe that Jesus could heal a nobleman's son in one place and a centurion's servant in another. But let me give you the differences. Jesus is here in Cana. When you read the story of the centurion, he is in Capernaum. Jesus is. Um, Here you have a royal official. There you have a centurion. Here he has a sick son. There you have a sick servant. But those are just small details. I think the most important is this because it's the theme of what's going on here. In this passage, Jesus will not commend the faith of this nobleman. He won't do that because he's confronting his faith. In the story of the centurion's servant, the faith of the centurion is commended because his faith is greater than all he has found in all of Israel. A completely different point. So I believe these are different stories altogether, but that's just as a side note. So here we have everything set up. What's going to take place? Look at verse 47. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So this man travels the 16 miles to Jesus. No no doubt is a last resort. You know, if he was a royal official, I'm sure he had uh, many resources. And at this point, he had exhausted all of his local and financial resources. He had nowhere else to turn. Now, I don't want to remove the humanity from this. This man has a child that's dying. For those of you who have children in the room, honestly, would, would you not do whatever you needed to do? Right? There would be no sum too big to pay. Right? You would do whatever it took. So I don't want to remove that from here at all. This man is desperate. It's clear from his imploring. He implored, erotaro, literally means he was imploring. Here he is, he is repeatedly begging Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son. And at this point, I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer it out loud. It's just something to think about. Does this man have belief in Jesus? Now he's come to Jesus. He has a sick son. He has a need. Jesus has healed people. He's come to Jesus. Well, he believes Jesus exists. That's obvious. He believes that Jesus can possibly heal his son. That's true. But let's ask this question instead. What does he not believe about Jesus? Maybe that's what we need to start with. What's he not believe about Jesus? Because in his request of Jesus, he has made two incorrect assumptions. I don't know if you spotted them. 
Look what he says to him. He implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus rebukes him. Look at verse 48. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Just seems out of place, doesn't it? Here's a desperate man, no, no doubt crying, come heal my son. Oh, there's no belief. You people always want signs and wonders. It just makes Jesus look like an uncompassionate, you know, a guy. What is going on here? Why does he rebuke this man? Doesn't his request for healing exhibit belief? No, it doesn't. And here's why. Two assumptions that are incorrectly made about Jesus. One, he assumes that Jesus has to be physically present at his son's side to heal him. Does Jesus need to do that? He doesn't. He doesn't. What has John been doing in the gospel so far? Who has he been presenting to us? You go back to John chapter 1. This is not just any ordinary man, is it? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Jesus made everything. There's nothing made that has been made. Jesus didn't have part in making. So this man comes to Jesus and says, can you come down to Capernaum and heal my son? What is he missing about Jesus? A lot. Second assumption, he hopes that Jesus had the power to heal his son's sickness, but he clearly had no hope that he could raise him from the dead. Did he? You've got to come now because my son is at the point of death. Because clearly, if he dies, it's, it's over. It's done. It's too late. So who does he think Jesus is? He's just a, a medicine man, a miracle worker, right? He can come just do something here and do it quickly because he's about to die. He does not have belief, saving faith, in Jesus. So what is this man driven by here? He's driven by fear, pressing physical and emotional needs, isn't he? He's desperate. And sometimes our faith uh, can be like this man, <laughs> can't it? Our physical and our uh, emotional needs can become so pressing that we just, we just forget who God is. We make him small, forget his power. And what Jesus is rebuking here is a weak, imperfect faith. He's rebuking unbelief. I just want to talk a minute about what that is then. What is that? What is, what is belief? What is, what is faith? Is it not trust? Let me just ask you a couple of questions. Don't we trust that the blood of Jesus does, in fact, cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Because I don't know about you, but I was never given sort of a righteousness, unrighteousness meter attached to my body. Maybe one of you has that, but I, I never got one. I missed out, right? Where I could see that, oh, yeah, there's a lot of unrighteousness that be, needs to be taken care of. Then the blood of Jesus took care of it, and so I'm good to go. I don't have that. Don't you trust in that? You have to trust in that. Don't we trust that through Jesus we become children of God? It takes a lot to make someone your child through adoption, doesn't it? There's relationships, father, mother, a child, tons of paperwork, there's a legal process, and there's a lot to prove this is now mine. Do you have that? I don't have that one signed by God that says I'm his child. Do you? Don't you trust that you are his child? Don't we trust that we have obtained eternal life, that we will avoid God's judgment, that we'll partake in the resurrection of life, that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do spiritual service for him? We trust in those things because God's word declares them to be true. We trust in them. This is the issue at stake. This man does not have that kind of faith, that kind of belief. And so Jesus rebukes him. And you notice he says, unless you people see signs and wonders. So he's not just speaking to the man. This man is representative of all the Galilean region, the people who would not receive him. The people said, we already know who you are. We know this, Jesus. We know your brothers. We know your sisters. We know who you are. You're nothing big. Yeah, you can do a few things, but whatever. Come do some more. We'll receive you. Give us a show. Mm. So Jesus rebukes him. And then the man doesn't respond at all. Verse 49. 
the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Now, I don't blame him. He's got one thing on his mind. He didn't come there to get his faith sharpened. He didn't come there for belief. Jesus comments on belief. He doesn't get that. That's not a context for him. He just says, I have an issue. My son's about to die. And so here he commands Jesus, come down before my child dies. And he even uses a different word, paideon. It's a, a more endearing and affectionate term for a young child. I think he's appealing to Jesus' compassion here. I have a child that's about to die. Jesus, have compassion. Do something here. I, I've heard that you're compassionate. I've heard that you're gracious. And guess what Jesus does? He compassionately and graciously answers his request, but not in the way the man expects. Not in the way the man expects. And here we're going to see his unbelief overcome. Look what Jesus does. Look at verse 50. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. Go your way. Your son lives. <laughs> Again, put yourself in this man's shoes. Right. Okay. Can I just make a quick phone call? Just, I, you know, send a quick email to just double check that. There's none of that, is there? There's no way to verify that. You can't check that. Your son lives. Oh, great. Well, he's 20 miles away. You're sure. You're absolutely you're positive. You, he, okay. Go. Go. What is Jesus doing here? What's he forcing him to do? Trust. Trust. Trust me. Trust me. He lives. Now, on a side note, at that very moment, Jesus said those words, your son lives. That boy was healed. Now, we as the readers, we know that. Jesus knew that. The father did not. No clue. No idea. No way to verify that. Your son lives. That happened. But something else happened. Jesus is telling him to, to go, to trust. And he goes. He believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. He believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went his way. Two things I want to point out here. And this is, these are massive. The man believes the word that Jesus spoke to him. Um, how important do you think God considers belief in his word? Just, would you put it up there anywhere? On a scale of one to ten? <laughs> it's pretty high, isn't it? Pretty high. I want to make a point here by taking you to first, first Samuel chapter 15. You can take a a moment to just go back with me. First Samuel chapter 15, way back in the Old Testament. This is when the nation of Israel no longer wants God as king. They want a human king, and God selects the king for them, King Saul. So this is a man that God has chosen and has used his own prophet Samuel to choose and to anoint. This is God's chosen man, Saul. And Saul already messes up because he makes an unlawful sacrifice. The prophet was supposed to make that because he was impatiently waiting for him. But he makes a larger blunder when he was given a command in chapter 15 to go and attack the Amalekites and wipe them out because of what they had done to Israel, ambush them when they had come out of uh, Egypt. And they don't do that. In verse 9, this is what we read, But Saul and the people spared Agag, who's the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So God comes to Samuel and says, he, this guy's not obeying me. He's not doing what I commanded him. And Samuel goes and confronts Saul in the rest of the passage and says, you didn't do what you were commanded to do. He says, yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, he says, okay, and then what's all the sheep I'm hearing? What's this? And, and Saul even denies it and has the audacity to blame it on the people um, and then tries to pass it off as, well, you know, we wanted to make a sacrifice, you know, for, for God. And here's what Samuel says in verse 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey 
is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And look at this, for rebellion, and that's what he's doing because he's not obeying, is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. God wants his word to be obeyed. And belief begins there. Belief begins there. Trusting in God is obedience to God. Therefore, trusting in Christ is obedience to Christ. But we can only be obedient to Christ if we know what he asks of us. How do we know what he asks of us? We must be in his word. This man believed the word that Jesus spoke. We have to be in his word. Many people just take the preacher at his word. Don't take me at my word. Check it for yourself. That's why I have this open every Sunday, by the way. Right? I have a Bible. You have a Bible. We're just, we're just going over God's word because it's not my word. But there are many who are spoon-fed man's word. Man's word. Jehovah Witnesses are spoon-fed word of the watchtower, but not God's word. Right? And if they were to read it for themselves, I guarantee they would come up to a different conclusion as to who Jesus is. So in the end, they would be condemned because of unbelief, because they don't believe in Jesus. They don't have trust in his word. They're not obedient to His word, and that's where belief starts. And Jesus, in giving this man his word that his son lives, is moving him from the man that needs the signs, that needs the miracles, to trusting in him. And that takes faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we're told this, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do you diligently seek him? him you have to be in his word it's not listening to me and what i tell you to how how i can tell you anything right don't people do that all over the world right here's how you diligently seek god each of you pay me 20 million dollars you're diligently seeking him right god gives you his approval people listen and that sounds ridiculous but people are duped by stuff like that don't be duped God's word is what we must adhere to. And here this man needed to not just listen to his word, but obey. And look what he did. He went his way. He went his way. He did obey. He followed in obedience. Another thing just to note, too, is that this movement from this this guy who needs the signs to just trusting in his word, it took something pretty big, didn't it? the sickness of his son, a deathly illness. This man needed to move from unbelief um, to belief in Christ's word, and God used something pretty horrific to do that. But he was bringing the son to the point of death so that he could bring the father to the point of life, right? Can I ask you something? Is Jesus concerned about the physical well-being of the child? I mean, is he concerned about it? He's not concerned about it because he can handle it. Do you understand what I'm saying? From his perspective, there's no, there's no time constraint on Jesus here. Who is Jesus more concerned about? The spiritual well-being of the Father, which is why he lashes out about belief. You people want belief. You want, you want signs and wonders, but you're not going to believe, so I'm going to help you believe. Your son lives. Now go. Just go. You got 20 miles. Think about that. What is this man going through during that trek home? Just walking step by step. Man, I wish I had a cell phone. Like he just, what? I just have to believe. I just got to trust. I got to go. I've got to walk this whole way. Yes, you do. And so he trusts. He goes. And that's our spiritual life, isn't it? We are called to trust. A belief that says, okay, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to believe. I'm going to obey. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk these 20 miles, or maybe it's for us, our lifetime, walking, heading that direction, right? But when I get there, everything is going to be validated. Everything I've trusted in is going to be true. I trust in eternal life. I know it's there, but I haven't received it yet, have I? But I'm going to receive it. I trust in those things. This man is trusting to see what when he gets home? 
a healthy boy, isn't he? That's what he's hoping to see. So let's see what he finds. Verse 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Now the seventh hour by the Jewish reckoning of time would have been about 1 p.m. So you have the afternoon time here. That's when the nobleman's son was, was made well. And when he does the math, he figures it out that that's the exact moment Jesus said your son lives. That's when he was healed. What's interesting to me that he doesn't ask anything else, at least it's not recorded here of these servants. Your son lives. Oh, how's he doing? Is he okay? What's his temperature like? What, you know, wouldn't you have all those questions? Those are far from this man's mind. He's been walking a long time. Would you not expect then, if, you're, if you have trust in God, would you not expect to see what he promised you you would see? If you're, if you're promised eternal life in heaven and you get there to heaven, are you going to go, okay, that's great, God, but what about, what about there on there? What did you do here? Did this work out? Are you going to be concerned about those things? Not at all. He is not asking questions about his son. He's asking questions about Jesus. Okay, hold on. When did that happen? The seventh hour. Oh, I knew it. That was, that was the moment he said it. He said, your son lives and he lived. That's incredible. That's a mind blowing. And he believed. He believed. He himself believed and not just him, his whole household. What does this man believe then? Didn't he believe back in verse 50? Is that, was that not belief? He trusted the word that Jesus spoke back in verse 50, and he went home in obedience, right? And what did trusting in Jesus in his word bring? It brought saving faith. This is the part that we get confused as Christians. A message has been poured out there into Christianity that is a false message. It's this idea of there's a prayer someone somewhere in the Bible, and if you just say this prayer this way, uh, it's sort of your, your, your sealed for eternity kind of a thing. You're, you're stamped, you're good to go. God accepts you. I've looked, I've never found that prayer. It doesn't exist. Instead, we're told to believe, to trust, to go in obedience, to do his work. That's what we're called to do. And if we do that faithfully through our lives, what would you expect to see? Saving faith. I'm here. That's how it works. You guys, that's how it works. All through the New Testament, we're encouraged to continue in our faith, to hold fast our confessions, to be diligent, to present ourselves approved to God. I'm going to take you through a few passages. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, we're told this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful. Hold fast your confession of hope. What's that mean? What's my confession of hope? I, the hope for eternal life. I, I confess, I believe in that. And I'm going to hold fast to that without wavering. And the reason is because he who made the promise to me is faithful. My hope is grounded on the faithfulness of Christ, right? That's where it's grounded. I trust in him. That's what this man had to do. He had to trust in the faithfulness of Christ and in his word. Don't get me wrong here. Christians are not called to a blind belief, Right? I just follow, I follow blindly. That's what I do. I just, you know, I just take it on faith. It's blind faith. No, it's not blind faith. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I know it to be true. I know it to be true. But I haven't received all those things. Like I said, I don't see, I don't see my unrighteous, righteous meter on me. I trust that God has done those things. Now, a mature Christian sees those things, doesn't he? You see it in your life. I see it in the lives of believers. I do see it. You have to have spiritual eyes to see it, though, don't you? You can see those things. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, Paul says this, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So much there. 
You were alienated. You were enemies. You were you were away from God. He's reconciled you. He's put you over here, and now you're made uh, holy. If you continue the faith, steadfast, sure. Now, you have to remember there are two perspectives in Scripture, right? God's perspective and human's perspective. In God's perspective, no one's going to snatch them out of my hand. Everyone the Father has given to me, I will by no means cast out, Jesus says. But from man's perspective, I, I don't see who's in the Father's hand. I, I don't have the Lamb's book of life. I can't read my name. But I continue in the faith steadfast and sure that's my job. Your job is not to know what's in the book. Your job is, is not to see the proof. Your job is to trust. That's my job, isn't it? We're to trust and continue in the faith and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we're called, told to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. To present myself approved to God. I'm stayed fa- I stayed a faithful worker the whole way. I've never deviated from being your servant, God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation, not work for salvation. We don't work for it. You have salvation, now work it out. And what do you work out? You work out what the Holy Spirit has worked in. Do you see that? It's the Holy Spirit who's given you everything you need to remain faithful, to continue working out your salvation. That's the distinction, and that's what we're called to do. And that's what this man had to experience. I think the Christian life was miniaturized and encompassed in a 20-mile walk for this man. You trust in Jesus. He says your son lives, and just walk. And guess what you're going to see? You're going to see your son living. You trust in Jesus, I grant you eternal life, forgiveness of sins. You won't face the wrath of God. Now you just walk in obedience. Guess what you're going to find? Eternal life, forgiveness of sins. Well done, good and faithful servant. I trust that those things will happen because his word has told me they will if I remain faithful, if I continue on that path. Guess when it won't happen? Guess what wouldn't happen for this man? This man decided, yeah, I'm not going to see that. I'm going to go this way. I'm, I, I'm not so concerned about that anymore. How about for believers, right? Will we expect to see eternal life and salvation? Will we expect to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Am I presenting myself as an approved worker? It's a dangerous place to be. I want to close here by taking you to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, just to make a right turn from where you are. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Here's another example, but I just wanted you to see it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You see that? Don't cast away. Don't cast away your confidence. That has reward. Your faith, I I believe that's going to happen. It's just going to require something, endurance, endurance. But listen, if you endure you're going to receive the promise. And then look at verse 37. He quotes Habakkuk, for yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition or destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. What is consistently preached in Scripture is not a one-time belief. I believed at one point in my life, and therefore I'm saved. You don't find it in Scripture. I'm sorry if you were told that. I'm just going to say it. You were lied to. Or they were ignorant. Maybe it wasn't deliberate, but it was untrue. It's a saving faith that takes continual believing. Continual believing. 
And we do it to the end of our days, you guys. We never stop doing that. And when you never, you never, what's he say? Fall back. You're going to see the reward that is promised in scripture. That's what's promised us. For this man in coming from Capernaum, desperately having one need, the health of his son, he left with so much more, didn't he? <laughs> he left with not just the health of his son, but the saving of his soul and, and of his whole household. No doubt, no doubt he expressed exactly what had taken place to the, the people in his household. And, and they believed as well. That Jesus is much more than just some healer roaming the land, right? Who, who, who can just say your son lives and he's healed? This is why the centurion's servant, the other example, is such an amazing thing because the man doesn't require him to come. He just says, you just say the word and I know he'll be healed. I know what authority looks like and you have it, man. <laughs> All right? That's what the centurion is saying. And that's why Jesus commends his faith. Jesus does not commend the faith of the nobleman. And in fact, he confronts his unbelief. But in confronting his unbelief leads him to belief, doesn't he? But through a difficult situation. We know many people who may be in that place. They think they believe and haven't really believed. You know what you can pray? God, God uses difficult situations sometimes to bring them there, doesn't he? Just like he did with this man, this, this sick man. You read the Hebrews chapter 11, you go through the hall of faith, and all those, all those people had difficult situations in which they had to overcome, but God used those things. And for the life of a believer, we're told in James chapter 1, when difficulty comes your way, to count it all joy. To count it joy, why? Because it's going to produce something in you, right? It's going to produce something in you. Patience, endurance, perseverance, and what that will do, it will make you mature, complete, not lacking anything, he says. Mature, complete, not lacking anything. The mature believer is going to be able to continue on steadfast to the end. Because he understands what God is doing, using even difficult things in your life to strengthen you and to make you trust in him more. Because it's when we begin to trust in ourselves that we veer away. May we not fall back. May we be like the man who will continue on to the end to see his son alive. We continue faithfully to the end. You guys, there's the good news. Eternal life with Jesus forever. We just went through Revelation. It's glorious. We have no idea, even as we read through Revelation, I just said, this just doesn't even do it justice. Heaven is incredible. Jesus has been spending this time making it for you. And that's your destiny, if you trust. Do you have true saving faith? Do you believe in him? And are you following in obedience? That's what is required. Jesus confronts the unbelief. May there not be unbelief here today. Let me pray. God, I thank you for your word, the truth of your word, God, as difficult as it may be to even hear, you chose to address it in a difficult situation. When a man was desperate, concerned for the health of his son, you chose to speak about belief. And why many may choose not to speak about that today, Lord, I, I must be faithful to your word. I'm, I'm worried for people, to be honest, I'm worried that there are people who are are trapped in unbelief, thinking they believe. They're like the man coming to Jesus saying, just heal my son. And Jesus saw something lacking. He didn't really believe in who he was. But you are the creator of all things. And you can done, do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. God, you are above all things. Mm. And we are grateful people today to know that includes redemption. That includes forgiveness. That includes wiping the sinful slate of our lives clean, removing it from us, and securing for us eternal salvation. God, I pray for your people today that they would not fall back, that they would walk faithfully straight to you into heaven by obedience and in faith and trust in you. God, help us I feel like the man who said, I believe, help my unbelief. Help our unbelief. Help us to believe fully and completely in all that you say and all that you do and to um, back that up by our actions. We love you. We thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.